Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Chapter 8, the great book of Daniel, which being translated as, My God is Judge. And boy, is he judge. And judging this world today, we find what, what an example he sets forth for us in giving us the information in Daniel and Revelation as to how what would consummate the end of this age. Now, we pick up with chapter 8, and we have a change here. We go back to pure Hebrew, uh, whereas it has been Syriac or Chaldean or Aramaic, whichever you wish to use, from back when the captivity began up till this time. So I like to think that these prophecies have to do with our coming out of Babylon or coming out of confusion, whereby you have a clearer understanding of our Father's word. Now, chapter 8 is still a chapter that uh, chronologically comes before even chapter 6, because Belchus's are, this will be his final year, and we go back to that, I feel most likely because he was the last king of Babylon in, in history, but is a type of that king of Babylon that comes, which is to say the false messiah. So having said that, we, we switch from the language of the captivity to the language of freedom. And here it goes, chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after, and it would be about two years later, after that which appeared unto me at the first. In other words, that first vision he had, here is another. About two years later, Daniel now at this time will be about 87 years old. Verse 2, And I saw in a village vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan, and Shushan meaning lily because of the amount of lilies that grew there, in the, in the um, palace which is in the province of Elam, and Elam means eternity. I think you're beginning to get the point. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Yule, which is to say uh, pure water. Now, wh where is this geographically? You need to know. It's at the head of the Persian Gulf. The Yule is a little river stream that runs into the Tigris, and naturally, the Tigris and the Euphrates running along uh, basically side by side and, and um, for uh, some distance. But here you have this little input. And no doubt this palace is where Daniel was when the three Hebrew children were in the fiery furnace. But here he is, and um, he's uh, in a place where today would be Iran so that you know where you're at and what's going on because it has a great deal to do with even prophecy today. Verse 3, Then I lifted up mine eyes and I saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up first. Well, the, the, the high one was Persia and the other was Media, okay? It was Media Persia. And um, th that would be the meaning of, of the uh, uh, ram. Verse 4, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand but he did according to his will and became great. They conquered Babylon. And what, what Daniel is seeing here is the fall of Babylon. And he also sees events 
that will transpire in the end times, and we will come to them in this chapter, verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, an he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Um, and of course, this horn is Alexander and is from Greece. And, and he would push westward, he would conquer the um, entire uh, uh, area. Verse 6, And he came to the ram that had two horns, Medio Persia, which I had seen, so far this is history, but it is a type of what's going to happen at the end. Seen standing before the river and ran into him in the fury of his power. There, there has never been in this area, this is switching from um, that that would be greed, maybe, and, and property ownership to religion. And that's what we have today. All the battles we have going today are over religious, uh, or for religious reasons, or, or so some would think. Though some religions can when it goes to the extreme, brings about insanity when people start blowing themselves up and, and so forth, especially children, seven. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler, that, that's bitter bile, against him, very bitter, and smote the ram and brake his two horns. In other words, he took down medial Persia. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. <clears throat> what you might consider is you're seeing the very first dream back in chapter 2 that he had of the great golden head, which was Babylon, and so on down it goes. Well, that's what you're seeing is these units and nations that control this area as they're coming down. Medio Persia, now we have Alexander, which is to say uh, Greece, verse 8. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great, <clears throat> and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones um, toward the four winds of heaven. And here we have those four winds again, and any time you have them, you want to be careful. They mean the end. Here is where it switches to religion, if you would. <clears throat> because as we noted in chapter 7 of the book of Daniel, as well as the chapter 7 of the great book of Revelation, and 3-7 in Ezekiel, chapter 37, the four winds always bring about the end of time, of this dispensation of time. And when that end comes to pass, then um, we know that we, this, um, this particular dispensation of time is finished. Verse 9, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south, and toward the east, um, and toward the pleasant land. That would even be Jerusalem. And this little horn, of course, uh, you, you will see who that is. Verse 10, it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. And of course, this is the coming of the false Messiah. He, he likes, he will, he will stamp many to the ground because they will give up their professed belief. That's what apostasy is, is changing your professed belief in an instant, meaning you worship the true Christ, but if they're ignorant that the false comes first, they switch to the false Christ. Switching their religion instantly, that's what apostasy is. Verse 11, the great apostasy, I should say. Verse 11, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, um, you have to know, what is this daily sacrifice? 
Well, it was sacrificial offerings of animals. Well, when was that done away with? 33 AD, when Christ won and for all times, where it would be written in Hebrews chapter 10, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, the offering for sin for one and all times. And so it was. It is, it is sacrilegious for anyone to think they must offer an animal for a sacrifice of sins today when Christ, the highest sacrifice there could ever be because he was perfect and he, he was sacrificed for us that in repenting and loving him, he gives us eternal life whereby we overcome sin and death uh, into eternal life. But here we see this false one that he comes in the middle of the week and takes away the daily sacrifice. Why? Because he you will find in the ninth chapter, he claims to be Christ and he wants the sacrifice to be taken to him. That is to say, worshiped. He wishes to be worshiped as Messiah. And you will find in the ninth chapter, he accomplishes it. We have several chapters here that um, lead up to and explain in detail the end times. You just have to relax and enjoy and sort it out. But here, uh, from the very sanctuary itself means the Holy of Holies. Verse 12, and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of what? Transgression. Transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. In other words, the truth is what? It's the word of God. This one is going to cast down our Father's word, stand against him, and as Paul would warn in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he intends to stand in the holy place claiming to be God. This is before Christ returns to us. Are you mentally equipped and spiritually equipped to handle that? because God's election or those that truly love the Lord have somewhat to do. And that is to be a witness and to uphold that truth and never shall, all, well, shall it totally be cast to the ground because we will, not, we will not stand for it. We will always witness that truth. And that truth is Christ, the true Christ, not the fake, not the fraud. 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long, here comes a question, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, that is to say of the desolator and of Christ, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under foot? In other words, how, how long is this going to be? from the sanctuary being trodden underfoot until the cleansing. Verse 14, your answer. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Then shall it be vindicated. Then shall the um, uh, God's own discretion and vengeance, the day of vengeance shall come and vindication shall take place. Now, what does this mean then? Well, you, first of all, you would need to be familiar with God's word enough to know when was the last time the sanctuary was cleansed? I mean, Belshazzar, who was the king of Babylon at this time, had gone and emptied the temple of, of the holy vessels, drew a big drunk with them, it certainly wasn't then. And then from history, you know that you have to go all the way back to Joshua chapter 23, verse 13, where God makes it very clear. I'm going to cleanse the sanctuary, but I'll never cleanse it again until the end. And so you have the answer to the, 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 to the uh, uh, parable that it will be trodden underfoot and, and it was at, at the passing of Moses, I mean, almost instantly, the, the sanctuary was filthy again. And, and so it was that it has been trodden underfoot. As a matter of fact, 
What, is it, what does it mean? Well, it means that Gentiles will control the very sacred place, which is the rock, and that rock signifying Christ and the place that the true Holy of Holies stands. And certainly um, it is still controlled even to this day by Gentiles. And it shall be until God vindicates and until God cleanses it. Well, how long is, how long is this um, 2,300 2, days? Well, you're going to find out that God gives us a formula in chapter uh, 11 and 12, especially chapter 12, to know kind of how to figure this whereby this precedent is set. And today we, we know the final generation, the generation of the fig tree, because of the knowledge that God gives us from his word that naturally that generation of the fig tree, which would be the final generation because all prophecy would come to pass within that period of time. And you have that written in uh, Mark, chapter, Mark chapter 13, where all prophecies would be fulfilled in the generation of the fig tree. That's why you're supposed to learn it. So I will say one more time, this um, you will find a common denominator of 1.484, which would bring this point up to Pentecost Day 1981 when Mount, Mount St. Helens erupted. And what, what a wonderful time. And what, what a benchmark to let the final generation know and understand. Put that on the shelf for the time being, and we'll go much deeper into that in the 12th chapter. Verse 15, and it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. It's a man right there standing before me, 16. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Yulna, that's to say pure water, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Now, well, what, what, what does Gabriel mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means God's man. So you, you've got God's man right here, and he's going to explain this to Daniel. Now, I'm going to check you out just a little bit. Is that, well, Gabriel did. Gabriel explained the whole thing. No, God instructed Gabriel how to explain the whole thing. Don't ever take anything away from God or you're looking for trouble. Gabriel was a servant of the living God. And Gabriel followed the instructions that the angel of the Lord had instructed. 17, it was the Lord's doings is what I mean. 17, and he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, and I fell down on my face, but he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. No, this is not for now. It's for the end of the time, which means it's in this generation, the generation of the fig tree. Verse 18, how, uh, now rather, as he was speaking with me, I was in deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. God always wants you to be upright. He doesn't want you down on the ground. Verse 19, and he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. I'm going to show you exactly how it's going down. Verse 20, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Now, there's no, no mystery there, all laid out from God himself. 21, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, that's Alexander. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And certainly um, uh, would be Alexander, but... Uh, also through prophecy and through history, many things can transpire with types. 22, now that being broken, whereas four stood um, up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up 
out of the nations, but not in his power, but, but naturally in Satan's power. This turns religious. 23, and in the latter time, when, when was that again? In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of furious countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And of course, this is the false Messiah. This is the Antichrist. This is what some would call the false prophet. But it all comes in the power of Satan. Verse 24, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully. That means with peace, not war. Don't you get caught in that crack. War is not how the end comes to pass. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, the end is not yet. But when you hear of peace, 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 you better be real careful. And shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. With what? If it were possible, he would. He will make a stab at it. He will not get it done. Why? We're not going to bend. We're not going to break. Why? Because we have a captain, and that captain is the Lord, the true Christ. And the truth always reigns supreme. A lie cannot stand in front of it. This is why it's written, as I mentioned in the last lecture in Luke 21, that what you say when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say and how, how fantastic it is that our father uses his children. But this, this person, you know, many people will be deceived because all these so-called religious, so-called uh, voices, they picture the coming of the end as war and terrible calamity. And they don't understand that that terrible calamity is the power of Satan causing the whole world to worship him. It doesn't get any lower than that. And, and um, uh, you talk about, you know, what they're worried about is people murdering uh, people. He murders souls. By that I mean he misleads them away from the true God by peace and prosperity, not war, not anger, and this is what deceives people. They will not listen to God's word. They must beat the drums of anger and, and uh, involvement, even though God says when you hear of wars and rumors of wars in the New Testament, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, the end's not yet. That's not when it happens. But when they cry peace, peace, which is the opposite of war, you better watch out for the deception is there, and he comes in mightily. And if it were possible, if it were possible, he would deceive even the very elect. It's not possible. For as it is written in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, God's elect will stand against the false one. And when they say, here is Christ, believe him not, believe them not, and don't go, for he's a fake. As long as you're in a flesh body, the seventh trump hasn't sounded and the true Christ hasn't returned, but the fake will return at the sixth trump, as you learn in that um, great um, book of Revelation. Verse 25, and through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. I, I mean, it's going to be beautiful. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. Oh, he's proud of himself. And by peace, don't ever read over that. By what? By peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hands. Man won't destroy him. Christ will. He's going into the pit as we learned in the great book of Revelation in chapter 20. And he is bound there for a thousand year period. 
but don't ever read over that part. Do you believe God's word or do you believe these ratchet jaws that like to make movies about the end is near to blow you up and all that kind of, it's junk. That's not the way it happens, and that's why a lot of people are going to be deceived. Anybody that makes wars of the end being uh, bombs and rocketry and uh, destruction or playing strictly into Satan's hand or even being used of Satan, being, they are, are being used by the devil himself to deceive people. And because this junk of wars and rumors of wars of the apocalypse will cause many people to be deceived when he comes in just the opposite, prosperously and peacefully solving all the problems of the world, seemingly. I'll say that again. He comes in prosperously and peacefully solving all the problems of the world. People are going to go nuts over him because finally, the world has peace, they think. But to us, we know the difference. Now that's, this makes it even a more difficult thing to stand against. And this is why God does not expect us to speak against it when you're delivered up uh, before this one that is this peacemonger. But the Holy Spirit will take over and we'll do the talking as it is written in Acts chapter 2 and from the Old Testament long before predicted as it is written in the minor prophet book of Joel chapter 2 that both sons and daughters will stand against him and witness against him in the end times when he comes in prosperously and peacefully. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you that um, as to how he appears and how he comes in. By peace shall he destroy many in that 25th verse. Don't, don't be deceived. People will try to pull you away from that true fact. But it's the very peace that he brings that causes many to worship him. You know, a lot of people will buy anything to get out of trouble, get out of debt, get out of hardships, He's got the answer. Oh, I mean, he's going to put a chicken in every pot. It's, go, it's going to be a fantastic time. And he will buy people with religion, with political, with education, and with religion. Those are the four hidden dynasties. Boy, is he good at them. But you have the word of God. You have been forewarned. Gabriel made it very clear, this isn't for now, it's for the end times. These are the end times. This is now. And when this one, who Alexander was only a type, the forerunner, when you have this one, this little horn that stands up and cries peace and religion and wonderful, love your brother, everybody is equal, you share the wealth, everybody's the same. Be careful, my friend, for God rewards those that deserve it. He does not reward those that do not deserve it. He comes in prosperously and peacefully and even stands against the true Christ himself. And yet at the same time, human beings will run after him, will chase him. Verse 26, and the vision of the evening and morning which was told is true. This is what's going to happen. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. It's going to be at the end times. What, what, what is this evening and morning business? That's when the offering was given. That's when the daily sacrifice was given. This goes all the way back to verse... Uh, 13 and 14 concerning the cleansing of the sanctuary and the daily sacrifice being taken away. That's the evening and the morning and the evening sacrifice. Close the book. Well, Christ closed that book a long time ago when he himself became the sacrifice of all times. But 
there is one coming that's going to want you to sacrifice to him. In that respect, do not close the book. For Daniel could close the book because he was hundreds of years before the fact, but you're not. You're living it. You're in it right now. So see that you stay prepared and don't ever, whatever you do, forget the 25th verse of this chapter as to how the false Christ comes in. He comes in by peace and shall destroy many and even stand against the true Christ. Don't ever forget that. Verse 27, to, to, um, to complete the chapter, verse 27 reads, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days afterward. I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. He did because Gabriel had explained it. But it was yet future. But it did make him sick when he thought of how, how tricky Satan can be to deceive people into saying he's the prince of peace. You do understand that. You can put that together, can't you? If he comes in by peace, he claims to be the Prince of Peace. Claims to be Christ. And the whole world that's looking for a rapture is going to jump on his wagon because he is not human. He's supernatural. And he can perform miracles like a human man is, a child, a woman has ever seen. And at the same time, comes in peacefully and prosperously. Who couldn't love that? I can tell you, I can tell you who would not love that peaceful and prosperity approach. People that know the truth and understand it. That regardless of how he comes in, he's a fraud. He's a fake. And he can cause your very soul to perish if you listen to him. That's how dangerous it is. You see, he cares, he takes care of your flesh body with peace and prosperity. But he murders your soul if you listen to him because he steals your eternal life away from you. You don't want that to happen. How fantastic that, I, I want to say again, well, well, Gabriel sure straightened him out. Gabriel did not. God sent the saints to address Gabriel and instructed Gabriel what to say to Daniel. Give God the credit. And you better always worship the true father, not this fake. Because the fake's coming first. Are you prepared for it? Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular discs. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's Word informs us on all things. Ezekiel, one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman Gog, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it. The Book of Ezekiel. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. That's just like the book of Daniel. Daniel meaning God is judge. He is. We're not. So uh, don't ask us to judge a situation. Leave that in God's hands. You have the right to discern, even as we have the right to discern but not to judge. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Uh, always a pleasure to hear from you. Now, got a prayer request. You don't need a number. You don't need an address. Why? 
God knows what you're thinking. You're his child, and he loves you. Do you know something? Have you ever read Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4? Your soul belongs to him. You don't get around to giving it to him. It's his. He's got it. It's his to do with as he judges. So that's why you want to be sure you love him so that he returns love instead, in, in, um, instead of correction. What, what a wonderful father we have when you address him properly and return the love that he gives to you. Father, around the throne of the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with Billy from Georgia. I want to know what day was Adam and Eve made in. Thank you and enjoy your teaching. They were, our Heavenly Father created all things in, in, in six days. He created all the races. Uh, he made fishers out of some of them, fishermen and some hunters, and told them to replenish the earth again, for as it was before he had uh, destroyed uh, the first earth age. And he rested the seventh day, and then on the eighth day, he created Eth Ha Adam, which is a different man, Adam, the Adam, as you ask of, and Eve, who would be the mother of all living. Why? Because Christ would come through her womb, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, and you are, are either in Christ or you're not living. You don't have eternal life. It is eternal life that God grants. Um, Living in the flesh is certainly not eternal life, and they, he, they were created on the eighth day, okay? Sue from Tennessee, I, I have a dilemma. I would like to ask you what I should do. Should a woman always wear dresses to church? I am a big woman, and I have many pant, pairs of pants, but not many dresses. Is it okay to wear dresses and, I mean, um, pants to church? With pants, I know I am covered up and I could wear an apron or something like that. Um, huh, th thank you. Well, you know, it is written in Deuteronomy that a woman should not wear men's clothing, but men wore skirts when Deuteronomy 22, 20, uh, and 22 were written. And so naturally, um, if you were wearing a dress, you'd be in men's clothing. A pantsuit is not men's clothing. Some of these preachers that think a pantsuit is a man's clothing should try to put one on because they're not really made cut to order for men. It's, it is a perfect suit. Now, naturally, it would be wrong for you to go into a church that forbid this if a church has certain rules that you should only wear a dress, then if you're going to go there, wear a dress. But if you um, feel, I mean, it's not necessary. So if I were you and that uncomfortable with it, I'd go to a different church. I'd go to one where the, the pantsuit was appropriate, and it should be. You know, I, I understand your plight, because if you were a minister, such as this man is, and you stood at the front of a large congregation, you could understand why that many times the pants suit is preferable. Okay. And uh, enough said. But men did wear skirts at that time, and uh, that's why Jesus would say, gird yourself up, because you pulled, the men pulled their skirts up where their legs were free, where they could have action. Okay, uh, Milton from North Carolina. Was the city of Nazareth originally formed by people who took the vow of the Nazarite? Well, some of them did, yeah, but basically it was uh, named this, and it was, it, was a, it was a poor, by some people's estimation, but rich in many other ways, that it was a farming community. As, as one downtown boy would say at one time, whatever good has come out of Nazareth? Well, Christ did. Uh, I... I hear teaching about numbers having certain meanings, like 40 means completion. Now, let me correct you. 40 does not mean completion. 40 means probation. Okay. Um, 
seven meaning spiritual completeness, that's correct. Five meaning grace, that's correct. And four meaning earth, that's correct. How does the Bible document these number meanings? Well, because of the usage of them, like you heard today, the four winds, the four has to do with those four winds on earth bringing about the end of the dispensation of time for this earth. Plus, the earth has four seasons, summer, spring, fall, and winter. Four, it has four directions, north, south, east, west, and so forth. We have a book in our library that uh, addresses all of those. It's a, it's a nice little, we have two that address numbers. Uh, Olivia from Georgia, are ghosts real? Familiar spirits are. There's not one behind every bush, certainly. But um, there is really, there's no such thing as a ghost. Okay? But you do have spirits, both good and evil. And, uh, some, and a familiar spirit, uh, as it is utilized in the Old Testament, is certainly up to no good <clears throat> and um, is, 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 a, is a very bad thing. But we have power over all those things. You don't have to worry about them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do. Brad from Illinois. When you refer to A.D., is that in Greek or Hebrew? And what does it mean? How, how do you say it? Well, it's, it's neither Greek nor is it Hebrew. It's Latin, the term A.D. And it is, um, the Latin, it is two words, Anna Domini, the year of our Lord. That's how you say it, Anna Domini, the year of our Lord, which the Lord was born, of course, at that time. But it is Latin. It's neither Greek nor Hebrew. Uh, Jean from, or Dean from Tennessee. My question is, what does it mean by begotten when God said, my begotten son and is God and Christ one, meaning is it himself who came to earth? I enjoy your program. I watch it every morning. Well, thank you. <clears throat> He went a little more specific. He said, Christ is my only begotten. He was the only begotten of Almighty God. It goes all the way back to the beginning. It is amazing how often I have this question. God said, let us create or make man in our image, including himself. And naturally, when he included himself, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 came into being, whereby it states, a virgin, and it was necessary that she be a virgin, shall conceive, and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning translated, God with us. So naturally, he was God with us, only he was in a form that we could see because God is in a different dimension than we are when we are in the flesh. Uh, this is why Christ would say in uh, St. John chapter 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. End of story. Um, okay, anonymous, please keep my location and name anonymous. I have been alone for many years and I never dated after my divorce. I met a friend with some beliefs and walks and talks his beliefs as I do. I am strongly attracted to him but afraid of ruining the friendship and receiving rejection by telling him and he didn't feel the same. Well, you're praying about it and, and, um, I, I, and I, I would not be depressed about it. I mean. I am I am a strong believer in communication. If if he is uh, that good of a friend, I mean, you, there's there are ways that you can you can find out if he feels mutually the same. But keep praying about it and ask God to intercede. Okay, God can change minds; man can't. But uh, naturally, uh, it is wonderful just to have a good friend. And maybe that's all he wishes to be. Don't be depressed about it is what I'm saying. But I am a strong believer in communication. Even, even a couple that is married, if they do not communicate, there's trouble. 
They're, I mean, their they're trouble going somewhere to happen. You have to communicate. Why? Because people are very understanding as long as you communicate and explain what you're doing and why you're doing it. For them, of course, you know. If a man, if a man needs, um, if a man needs a, a new lawnmower, you you talk about getting the wife um, a new washing machine or something. Okay, there's there's ways of working things uh, if she needs one, of course. But always keep keep a good balance is what I'm saying. Communicate, communicate. David from Indiana, why was Satan a snake and why does he want to be stronger than God? Well, now Satan has many roles. Just as we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Satan is the serpent, the dragon, the devil, Lucifer, uh, the little horn. He, has, he goes by many names and roles and that's why he deceives so many people. But he's still one entity, one singular entity. And he, he wouldn't have it any other way. He is so proud of himself. That was his very fall in the beginning. And, you know, and, and he had worked himself through loyalty and service to Almighty God to a very high position, was a good person. And then, boy, when he went bad, did he go bad big time. But um, the... The figure serpent is a figure of speech. Okay. He was not literally a snake. But, and the word snake can even be translated, serpent can be translated the glistening one. And he was a glistening one. It could even be translated the upright one. And, uh, and so it is. You need to think about that a little bit. A name of degradation. Abraham from Minnesota. My question is the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why these books teach the same thing if it were written by different persons? Well, because they witnessed what happened there. And God always demands that you have a second witness and even a third if possible. And here we're really blessed because they're not... Though they cover the same thing, there, is, there are, as men are, some were at different places where the others maybe were not, and they report on that incident. So by combining all four Gospels, you have a pretty good coverage of actually what transpired from those various angles. Now, for example, the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew chapter 24, the book of Mark, chapter 13, the book of Luke, 21. They all cover the same subject. Matthew and Mark hit it head on, but Luke turns around then and gives you a side profile, whereby you see both straight on and a profile, which gives you a better understanding of how the end times will be. It's, it is precious uh, to make a study of God's word. Uh, Michelle from Maine. Pastor Murray, seeing that Christ went to teach them on the wrong side of the gulf who died before Christ, does that mean that no one who was that had, who had that opportunity to learn will get to redeem themselves in the millennium because Christ gave them their chance already? In other words, is it correct to assume that no one who died before Christ will go through the millennium other than teachers? Well, I, I would not want to, I would not be comfortable judging that because there, there are extenuating circumstances to every situation. This is why God said, you let me be the judge. Only God sitting on that great white throne can decide who does and who doesn't. And he is a loving God. And I am not one to say that someone, if they uh, repented through the millennium, could not take part in the second resurrection. That's up to our Father. So I, I appreciate the question, but it kind of, you're asking me to judge a situation that only God can do, okay? I, I certainly understand your point. And in large part, you're correct.
but the final judgment belongs to God. Fred from Florida, I understand we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, thanks to you. I know this, but what is, and the dead will be raised imperishable, if, if the dead are already back in paradise. Well, it means um, you want to realize there are two different kind of dead. And you're, you're quoting from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, I think. I'm pretty sure that's where you're quoting from. What it means is we're all going to be changed, but there are some people that are spiritually dead that will be put on the incorruptible body, but they will still have a mortal soul. That's why a mortal soul must put on immortality, that you leave that part out because a person that only has a mortal soul is spiritually dead. That is called, when we're all changed into spiritual bodies, death means the spiritually dead. That's why they are taught through the millennium, and if they take part in the second resurrection, that being God's business, then they overcome. If not, they're headed for the lake, okay? But um, all are changed but not everybody is changed into an immortal soul, meaning deathlessness. They still have a, somewhat to go. Uh, okay, um, I'm trying to figure out who this is. Uh, Nina, I'm going to say it's Nina from Florida. I listen to your Bible study in the morning, and I have learned a lot. Thanks. You're welcome. Why would would you explain Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 16? Ezekiel was this is where the four winds are brought together is in chapter 37. And what God's said here is you take two sticks and put them together. And one of them is at the end the house of Judah and the house of Israel will come back to being one house. At this time, they are separate. This is where many people make errors in understanding the Word of God. The house of Judah and the house of Israel are two separate houses right now, and they will remain separate until Ezekiel 37 uh, and, and uh, verse 16 comes to pass. Then they will be one stick again and one family, and so it will be. I, I could add to that, not only will both houses be the same, but all of God's children will come to worship him. Uh, Peter from Wisconsin, could you please tell me, on air if possible, if the one ounce silver bars I've collected can be used to pay utilities and rent in that five month period before the seventh trump? Well, you, you barter with them, okay? You, it, there's nothing wrong with having, in other words, wh what you do is you tell a neighbor, hey, I'm a little short, but I've got this precious metal. Could I get you to pay my rent for this month and let me give you the precious metal equivalent? Okay. It's called bartering from the old days. You're from, you're from uh, Wisconsin. You, you, you've got some old timers there that can tell you all about bartering. Okay, so that, that's the way you do it. Uh, David from New Hampshire, Pastor Murray, the picture of the rapture, and here is, this is one of those pictures where they've got the cars wrecking and buses running over and trains going out of control and a bunch of ghosts flying up. Um, uh, this, this picture of the rapture makes Jesus look like a terrorist. <laughs> would, why would uh, Jesus... Uh, wreck cars and airplanes when he returns. He wouldn't, and uh, th and you're absolutely right. What what how how mixed up and misleading religion can be when it isn't taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse. When Christ returns, he takes control and destroys that that is evil, not that that is good. That's just the way he is. Uh, Dana from Georgia, the, God bless you, thank you, 
also a big thing. You're so welcome. The five months, May through September, that is the political and religious beast, Revelation 13. Is it a possibility that September being the month Jesus was born, that Jesus could return on his birth date? Uh, it's possible. We don't know what year, but that's, we're told to be careful through that five months period, which runs May through September, and he was born in September, not December. It was the conception that took place in December. Um, okay, we got Margie and Linda from North Carolina. Pastor Murray, thank you for your teachings. You're welcome. I understand the Bible now from your teachings. You're a good a God sent preacher and teacher. I recently re educate, rededicated my life to God. I've been learning from your teaching ever since. Please explain about Job, verse 6, chapter 6. My sister asked me, and I can't make sense or understand it. I love you. Well, um, and here I'm running out of time. It simply means uh, really what it says. You don't. Those things do not and are not productive. So you really don't expect production from it. I'm out of time. i got to go. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. And when, when um, you let Him know you love Him, boy, He returns that love. You bless Him. He always blesses you. And uh, we, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. And again, blessing Him. He always returns that blessing. There's one thing that's most important, though, in your personal life, and that's this, and you listen real good. You, you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word, whatever your appetite is for study, is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student.
welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Open your Bible and let's go to class with Dr. Murray for a better understanding of our Father's Word. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God for the privilege of allowing us to serve Him, that we can deal in His Word, teach His Word, and allow our Father to do the speaking through that Word. We just thank Him so much for that. In the precious name of Yeshua, may He send us a word of wisdom. Okay. Discerning dreams. It's very important to you, beloved. In discerning dreams, by that, by that title, I mean being able to discern dreamers and prophets, so-called.